So I've been, in this context, I've been interested in uh, uh, the controversy on the representation of production in growth models between uh, what we could call natural resources economics and ecological economics, which has uh, basically started in the early 70s and has been revived by the late 90s and has never been really closed since then. So by natural resources economics, I mean uh, the neoclassical version of uh, the growth theory with uh, exhaustible resources, and in particular the work of uh, Robert Solow and Joseph uh, Stiglitz, who have set the foundations of uh, this approach in the, the early 70s. And on the side of uh, ecological economics, uh, Georgescu Rogan, uh, Nicolas Georgescu Rogan, argued that this representation of uh, production was not consistent with uh, thermodynamic laws. And uh, later, Herman Daly, in uh, 1997, revived his criticism and triggered a direct confrontation between natural resources economics and ecological economics, which we will talk later. So I'm interested in uh, uh, analyzing the fundamental concept of uh, both paradigms and the methodological uh, uh, foundations on which they rely. Uh, since it's a short presentation, I, I will try to go to the essential, but uh, be as clear as possible. And so I will first present uh, Solos and Stiglitz models, then Georges Kurogan's criticism of their representation of production, and finish with uh, the debate of 1997. So starting with Solo and Stiglitz, uh, Robert Solo's address to the American Economic Association in December 1973 reminds us of how the, the story begins. So basically, it's the report on the limits to growth that triggered his interest for natural resources. And he decided he ought to find out what economic theory has to say about the problems connected with exhaustible resources. So his work and that of uh, Joseph Stiglitz were published in 1974. And uh, they rely on the framework of the neoclassical growth theory, which was developed in 1956 by uh, Solo himself, and which relies wh where the production is represented with a production function. We have had talks before on the subject. So basically, it's uh, uh, a relation between the level of output and the level of the factors of production. And where traditionally, in growth theory, only uh, aggregate capital K and labor L were considered as relevant factors of production, natural resources economics introduced the flow of uh, resources R in the, produc the production function, which yield this form. And uh, so resources uh, under interest are either uh, energy resources or even uh, minerals. But the important fact is that they be exhaustible and uh, taken from a finite stock. And the goal of, uh, of Solo and Stiglitz is to know if an hypothetical economy represented by this kind of model uh, can achieve a constant consumption per head across generations uh, without exhausting the total stock of resources. So if we uh, go further into the specifications of uh, the production function, we come across this assumption uh, of unbounded resources productivity, which uh, Solo, explain well Solo explains that this the interesting case is one in which R equals zero and takes that Q equals zero, but that the average product of R has no upper bound, which I, uh, I call unbounded resources productivity. And so, as we see here, uh, the interest of, well, the, 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 this assumption is mainly motivated by concerns of mathematical concerns of avoiding trivial cases where the answer to the, prob to the initial problem is obviously positive or obviously negative. And this assumption of uh, unbounded resources productivity will be at the center of the controversy with ecological economics. So with this uh, common assumption, Solo and Stiglitz will explore the slightly different uh, cases with slightly different specification of production functions. So for example, Solo considers the case of a constant population and with no technical progress, 
where he uses the Cobb Douglas pr production function with this form. So here, uh, unbounded resources productivity is mainly achieved by the substitu substitutability of capital to resources, uh, which mathematically means that the ratio Q over R can grow indefinitely provided, provided that K is large enough. On his side, uh, Stiglitz considers the case of a growing population at a constant rate, and he introduces uh, technical progress with an exponential term, which yields and, and uses by otherwise a similar Cobb Douglas production function. So he has this kind of uh, this kind of function. And now, unbounded resources productivity is mainly related to uh, technical progress, which is mathematically just a variation of the production function that is unexplained by other factors of production. So uh, with these assumptions, both find that consum constant consumption per head across generation is possible under certain conditions on the parameters, which are also linked to the magnitude of uh, substitutability and to the magnitude of technical progress. So basically, uh, Solo and Stiglitz have put forward two concepts to uh, support the idea of unbounded resources productivity. As uh, uh, Stiglitz summarizes, two offsetting forces have been identified, technical change and capital accumulation. And so we will now see how uh, technical progress and stu substitution are understood by these authors. And in fact, important conceptual shortcomings appear when these concepts are related to a uh, concrete transformation of the production process, like uh, in the real world, if we, if we can say. So for example, some illustrations refer rather to substitution between resources than between capital and resources. For example, when Solo uh, mentions the substitution by uh, nuclear or solar energy. So moreover, this idea of a substitution between natural resources is not consistent with their initial model where there is only one resource and no alternative resource comes in the model to substitute to the, to the exhaustible one. So here, this, this idea of substitution is not consistent. Um, the other illustration is uh, le less resource intensive goods by um, change changes in the composition of the output. But once again, the role played by capital in this idea of substitution is not really clear. And uh, this is not even consistent with the model where the, the output is just an aggregate production index where mm, there is no possibilities of, well, at least changes in the composition are not really considered. And the last illustration given by these authors is uh, the case of fuel saving technologies, uh, which in fact seem at least more consistent with the idea of capital substituting to resources. But the problem here is that this illustration is also used to con to for technical progress. So what we see is that the concepts of substitution and technical progress are not are somehow overlapping and that the, the they are not easily considered separately as it is done at the mathematical level in these models. So my suggestion is that uh, this, this, uh, these issues come from a model-based methodology where in fact the model precedes and gives rise to the concepts of the theory. So substitution and uh, technical progress are first mathematical properties of some production functions and when there are they are related to transformation actual transformation of the production process in the real world they are they reveal uh, inconsistencies nevertheless uh, uh, natural resources economists have kept on asserting that the assumption of unbounded resources productivity was relevant and they challenge what they call resource pessimists to show that substitution and technical progress do not enable unbounded resources productivity. And among uh, res resource pessimists, uh, they, they included Nicolas Georgescu-Rogan, who we'll see, uh, 
who will examine his criticism of uh, natural resources economics now. So, uh, Nicolas Georges Kurogan published in 1971 a book called The Entropy Law and the Economics Process, where, among other things, he advocates that uh, thermodynamic laws should be accounted for in uh, economic theory. And he says that from the purely physical point, the economic process is entropic. A few years later, in a paper called Energy and Economic Myths, he uses this approach uh, uh, to criticize the general technological optimism of neoclassical economists. And he, he mentions for the first time the idea of thermodynamic limits, which would be set by Carnot's theoretical coefficient of efficiency. So a quick reminder for those who are not familiar with this, but basically uh, Sadikano, one of the fathers of thermodynamics, demonstrated that um, thermal, thermal engines have, uh, the efficiency of thermal engines have, uh, has a theoretical maximum, which means that uh, the input of thermal, in, uh, of thermal energy cannot be fully uh, transformed into mechanical work by the engine. So, if we look further, in uh, so this first criticism was not specifically addressed to Solow and Stiglitz and their representation of production, but in uh, in his comments and papers by Daly and Stiglitz uh, in 1979, he uh, addresses more particularly to uh, to the work of Solow and Stiglitz and to the assumption of unbounded resources productivity, and he puts forward two arg two arguments. So first, he, he says that if capital increases to infinity, then resources will rapidly be exhausted by the production of capital. So here it just emphasizes that uh, capital itself is produced thanks to resources. However, uh, in Solow and Stiglitz models, this is accounted for because uh, capital is just taken on the output, which is itself produced from resources. And this does not prevent uh, capital from increasing to infinity in Solo's model, in Solo's model, because uh, uh, th the productivity of resources increases faster than capital. So this argument seems incomplete, and in fact needs to be logically founded on another argument that comes later, and uh, which is the idea of limits to the productivity of resources where uh, Georges Kurogan mentions, mentions again that the same service can be provided by a design that requires less matter or energy, but that even in this direction there exists a limit. S so, uh, however, um, while Carnot's coefficient of efficiency was more related to energy considerations, here we see that uh, Georges Kurogan tends to include also material requirements in the in this idea of uh, thermodynamic limits to the productivity of resources so what are the what is the the methodological uh, foundation of this approach my suggestion here is that uh, we could call we could call this an interdisciplinary consistency methodology since uh, Georges Kurogan thinks that in order to uh, understand the production process, we have to be the theory of production has to be consistent with other disciplines, with other body of knowledge uh, accounting for this uh, for production. And um, so his methodology ambitions to uh, found concepts and assumptions of eco the economic theory of production on thermodynamics. So a prospect that I, I, I think is somehow shared here, but what's interesting in Georges Kurogan approach is that it reveals also the problems, the issues that may arise in such, uh, such a perspective. And the first important issues is that of the interpretation of uh, thermodynamics, because if we look at how uh, um, Georges Kurogan initially argued for this idea of thermodynamic limits. We see that he links it to the, the efficiency of energy extraction, that is to the ratio of the energy extracted over the energy 
spent in the process. So basically, he, d he didn't use the word at the, at the time, but basically the ROI. And um, doing this, he, he says that Kano's principle implies a theoretical limit to this kind of, of efficiency. So we see that here, his reference to Kano is somehow misleading because there is no thermal engines implied, so the process is very different. And um, this justification seems misleading. Another important issue is the fact is uh, appears when Georges Kurogan makes out uh, now a, a general thermodynamic limit to the productivity of resources, and in particular in the fa in the fact that he doesn't consider the translation from physical to economic variables. So because uh, while Carnot's principle is 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 used for the transformation of uh, thermal energy into mechanical energy with energy units implied. The idea of a uh, limit to the productivity of resources uh, would imply production, which uh, which unit is not clearly linked with the u u units of energy. So the problem of variables is not accounted for by Georges Kurogan. Um, so himself didn't. Uh, didn't really develop more this idea of uh, thermodynamic limits. Just okay. But yes, but uh, Herman Daly, uh, but Herman Daly brought uh, brought this idea back uh, twenty years later and triggered uh, a direct confrontation between natural resources economists and ecological economists. So this is what I will briefly study. So in 1997, there was a, a special issue of the journal Ecological Economics dedicated to, to Georges Kurogan. And on this occasion, uh, Herman Daly revived his criticism in a paper called uh, Georges Kurogan versus Solo Stiglitz, which triggered uh, replies from Solo and Stiglitz and also many commentaries from ecological economists, from other ecological economists and natural resources economists. So Daly's interpretation of Georges Kurogan is that Solo and Stiglitz uh, give the appearance of respecting the first law of, thermod of thermodynamics, material balance, without really doing so. So as we see here, uh, Daly focuses mainly on the on the idea of the uh, on the conservation of mass between the input and the output of the production process, while while this idea of uh, while materials were mentioned by uh, uh, Georges Kurogan in 1979, as I have also suggested that initially his idea of the thermodynamics limits were linked to to Kano's principle and so rather to the idea of energy and the entropy law. So here again we see that. The interpretation of this idea of thermodynamic limits is not uh, really clear and straightforward in ecological economics. If we now regard uh, the what, ha what is said about the, the production function, uh, new, new interesting questions are, uh, are put forward by the debate. So first, Daly uh, suggests that Production functions can only pretend to represent substitution between the existing state of the art and not with the f with fut future technology, and that this makes the assumption of unbounded resources productivity even more inadequate, because it production functions would not include future technology. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Solo and Stiglitz didn't really reply to this question of. Uh, uh, the relation between actual state of the art improves uh, future technology and the production function. So the state of the production function related re relat relative to this question is not clear. Uh, another important question is whether uh, production function production is measured in physical or value units. Uh, with daily asserting that even production functions that yield services are producing a physical output while Stiglitz replies that output is measured not in physical units, but in the value of the services 
associated with, the, with it. So these questions once again shows that the notion of production itself has uh, needs more conceptual analysis in order to, to, to answer these questions and in particular that the relation between natural resources, the services they provide and the value of the services is still not conceptually very clear in this controversy. So I don't know one minute. So basically I, I will not repeat uh, what I have just said here, but what's interesting for me is that this, uh, this con these paradigms, I've later framed the analysis of sustainability in economics, because for example, Solo used the substitutability between mind-made capital and natural capital as a whole, uh, in order to advocate the what we call now weak sustainability uh, perspective, while ecological economists, and in particular daily, uh, used the, this idea of limits to substitution to promote the, the, the strong sustainability perspective. So this, controvers this controversy sheds some light on the opposition still, pet still relevant between weak and strong sustainability and on the conceptual issues it may vehiculate. And the other important uh, things that appear is that theories and models of production are at the center of preoccupations for uh, sustainability in uh, analysis in economics. And that uh, regarding this, the production function uh, has raised many questions in the controversy, but uh, also ecological economics didn't appear with a clear uh, theoretical alternative to this representation of production. So this invites to study further the theoretical and methodological uh, questions at stake in the representation of production with natural resources. And I thank you for your attention and I will be glad <laughs> to have your question. You argue that there has not been much progress within ecological economics also. Um, I think there has been a lot of progress over the last decades really. Let's only uh, remember the work by Benjamin War and Robert Ayers, by uh, Rainer Kümmel, Dietmar Lindenberger, that have continuously worked on precisely developing more realistic production functions um, with empirical estimation and that showed that Should I reply now? Oh yes. Uh, so I, I, I am working as another part of my PhD on these works. Uh, so the first thing that is important is that uh, they use production functions. So that more or less they have chosen to stay in the neoclassical framework. They just use other production functions, what they what they call uh, Linux production functions. So I, I don't. Uh, my my point is not to criticize this. Is to see how this as changed the perspective on the, the representation of production and uh, in, in fact there are the there are both theory in this approach there are both theoretical stakes and also empirical aspects to be to be studied so I have no answer right now what uh, what what uh, seems interesting is to to see how the problems that were raised in this controversy, are taken into account in these works and uh, and uh, others. So that's what I, I, I will intend to do step by step, looking at how different issues are dealt with or not in different perspectives. OK. 
Okay, I is there an another question? Yes. And yes, uh, just another point. I, I didn't say that uh, since then ecological economics has not uh, go gone further. My point is very historical, right? I, I'm not very uh, up to the point on the, the, the latest literature in the domain. So my point is to say, look, when these concepts were put forward, there were some thing, uh, th there were some issues, and maybe ask uh, whether these issues have been uh, taken into account now or not. Uh, Dominique Chauvin, prospectiviste, y you presented the subject of resources with two point of view: one which is purely economic, and the other one which is uh, uh, ecologic. But my question is about uh, upstream of that, is about the definition of resources, because in both cases assu you assume that resources is known and is well defined. My question is that even the concept of resources is not very well defined, because uh, taking into account the evolution of uh, uh, thinking and the time, the resources can become a nuisance with the time, which was the resources in the past can become a nuisance. And uh, uh, conversely, you can have uh, uh, some nuisance today, like CO2, for example, which could become a, res a resources uh, tomorrow. So uh, on a pure economical point of view, not only you have uh, this uh, divergence of uh, interpretation on uh, throughput, but you have also, in my opinion, uh, uh, an uncertainty about what resources is. Just an example, 20 years ago, in my company total, we decided to compute the reserves of the company, but uh, we decided on a, a sustainable development point of view to downgrade the reserve taken into account the, re the reserve which were below the, the forest or below uh, the town or whatever. And this was not accepted by the management of the company at that time. And presenting a result like that, it was a nonsense for them. But uh, 20 years after, it's uh, become to be a reality. So uh, on a pure economical point of view, the question about resources is an open question. So yes, th I think the, the situation is a bit different for uh, uh, natural resources economists and uh, ecological economists because, in fact, that's what I said. Natural resources economists mainly think about uh, from models, so they they don't even really care if you if you look at the literature, they don't even really care about what they call resources and what is its importance for economic production, etc. So I think that this is really from the model-based methodology, right? Uh, ecological economics, fr from their uh, thermodynamic point of view, have uh, pushed further, I guess, the notion of resource and try trying to identify more accurately what what should be what could be a resource in the long term or in the short term, etc. So the the question is a bit different, but yes, the the notion of resource itself could be a, a point of uh, of argument. So we will take two more questions. Yes, thank you for this talk. I, I'm Gilles Rammstein. I'm just a climate modeler, so I don't know many things about what you say. But it was really clear for me. It was really interesting to uh, and, s and very. Okay. But I get a question. Uh, I well maybe it's a very naive question, but you explain very well the difference between natural resources and uh, ecological mm, point of view and changing the prediction function. But for me, when you get a model and some understanding of a system, you may make some prediction that could be better in some framework than on the other. But you never talk about about this capability of your model to predict something. So I think this uh, is related to the first question too, because the question of, uh, of uh, predictive power of uh, a model or another one is related to the empirical question of uh, confronting these uh, these production functions with uh, actual data on energy, capital, labor, etc. So um, I have I have put aside this question because, in fact, in in the this liter this specific corpus, the, the question is very is not really dealt with. Uh, usually, Solo and Stiglitz refer to previous work on uh, production functions, uh, notably on, uh, by Nordos and Tobin. Uh, sorry, no, uh, and um, 
but they they don't really deal themselves with the problem. So trying to to separate uh, the different uh, different aspects of the question, I have been focusing on the theoretical stakes here, and I'm working on uh, the empirical uh, aspects of production functions with uh, energy resources in uh, other part of my work. But uh, as I, as I said before, this is a work in progress, and I, I would not pretend to to state now what what I think on this uh, on this question. But it's uh, it's it's the other side of the of the of the question. Coming coming back to your resource issue, let me phrase this question slightly different. Can you think of a single resource we don't have a substitute for? For example, fossil energy. We could go to lithium and deuterium and do fusion. We could go to solar energy, and those are substitutes then as well. And if you really don't have anything we couldn't substitute, then the question is, at what time scale is that a resource runs out relevant? Is it 200 years? Because technology changes an awful lot in 200 years. I mean, if you told me that the only thing we have is coal, I'd be very worried about running out of energy. But if I can substitute renewable energies, maybe we are worrying about the wrong thing. Yes, but wha wha what was interesting for me is that so <laughs> please let let, let the speaker mean. answer the question but wha what's interesting here is that this question of uh, transition and of substitution between resources is in fact not not on the table at the time because as we see when uh, when uh, solo and stiglitz uh, developed their first model they they are not considering at all substitution between resources no, but it's not substitution between resources. It's substitution between capital and resources. Yeah. So even yeah. if this notion, the problem is th that even this notion is not really clear in the mind of na natural resources economists. And uh, and th that's all I meant. I, I didn't say that there is no substitution between resources possible. I just said, look at how economists think of this issue and look at these conceptual problems that appear in what they call substitution and what they call technical progress. That's all my point. Uh, in I, 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 never, I never said that uh, substitution by other resources is not possible. Well, thank That's okay. Thank you, yes, thank you.